Okay, then. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, so, so before I said, so my role in the sort of, you know, uh, um, asteroid belt of minor bodies that is orbiting uh, Konsevich is the following one that uh, I take a small slice of his things, uh, mainly from the late 90s, and uh, I combine them with a small slice of Fukaya's and a small slice of Donaldson's things. Okay, so, so the, the rules for this game have been known essentially for a long time. There is a, a geometric ingredient, which is uh, the classical, which is the geometry of Lefschetz vibrations, um, which is a very rich thing. And I think we, we don't really understand how complex it is. And the main goal of the theory is to try to capture some of that complexity as much as we can. Then, so, so that, that's Donaldson's contribution. Then there's, there's Fukaya's contribution, which is, you know, the, the uh, associated uh, uh, theory of pseudo-holomorphic curves, which is also very complex, but you know, in some sense, in a way that we understand, right? So if you have a problem that you want to solve using pseudo-holomorphic curve theory, you have to decide which family of Riemann surfaces you're going to use, which auxiliary geometric data. But uh, it's, a, it's a finite amount of games. And, uh, and then there is, a, you know, um, well, one of the things that, that Sebich has contributed is, is a sort of a particular flavor of homological algebra, which you will use to sort of form, formulate your results and, and you know, capture the, the information that pseudo-homorphic curves give you. Um, so there are these three kinds of building blocks. And then there is a, you know, homological mirror symmetry, which is you know, like the, uh, uh, the building plan that will help you where, to tell you where things should go. Okay? So um, it's a little bit like putting together IKEA furniture. Okay? Um, and so my, my success so far is really equal to my success in putting together a, 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 a IKEA furniture, which means that at each step I'm convinced that this is exactly the way the things are supposed to go. And then when I look back, when I'm finished, it turns out that uh, you know, not only was this kind of clumsy what I did, but it's actually an obstruction to proceeding to the next step. So this has iterated several times. Uh, this is my latest iteration. I'm not particularly sanguine about it. Um, but hey, you, you just, um, that, that's what I can do. Okay? A, there won't be a particular amount of theorems uh, in this thing, but I'm, I'm trying to make some kind of picture. So the, the basic geometry here uh, in the case of, uh, classical case of, you know, say, a smooth projective variety, we have a line bundle and we have two sections and just, you know, Classical. Well, I don't want any of these sections to be zero. I also don't want them to be linearly uh, dependent. And in fact, I don't want the zero sections to have zero sets to have common components. So let's say if you take both zero sets, you intersect them. It has at least dimension two. You, you can assume that it's it's a generic pencil if you want. So um, so um, obviously there, there's a, 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 a hypersurface x zero, which is where s zero vanishes. There's a hypersurface x infinity, where s infinity vanishes. And then there's a whole pencil of hypersurfaces x z, which are defined by vanishing of some linear combination. And those hypersurfaces intersect all at the same thing, b. Okay, so if you don't mind that they intersect, you can think of the whole thing as being given by some not quite well-defined map to the projective line, whose uh, fibers are these x z. Or if you mind the fact that the fibers intersect, then uh, one thing you can do is you can remove one fiber, let's say the one at infinity, and then the quotient of these two things becomes a well-defined function, which lands you in the affine line. Uh, the fibers of that, are, are, um, of that function, w, are uh, not the original, not these xz, but the, the open parts where you remove the base locus. Okay? So there are um, you know, two different ways to, uh, that I'm interested in to look at these things. One is uh, to look at their topology and uh, look at their symplectic topology. So, um, so there we look, you know, we look at the singularities, we look at vanishing cycles, at monodromy representations. Uh, and since the vanishing cycles um, are Lagrangian submanifolds, it's natural to use symplectic topology to it. Um, and look at pseudo-holomorphic curves. So pseudo-holomorphic maps into X or into the fibers with various boundary conditions. Um, I think about this is still essentially topological. So um, you, you, don't, you, you don't really use the, the, the algebraic geometry very much. In particular, you, know, you don't really care about the single numbers. Like for instance, you know, where exactly the critical values are located on the complex plane isn't really important. If you sort of deform things slightly, that will be uh, sort of indistinguishable from this topological point of view, which is green. Okay. So the, the other point of view, which is sort of algebraic, which is purple, um, um, is uh, you know to really use look at these things here as as defining you know 
a family of algebraic varieties, xz, and uh, you, you know, you can look at them from the point of view of deformation theory, from the point of view of cycles, uh, from the point of view of Hodge theory, Gassmannian connection. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, to, to a large, I mean, not the Hodge theory, but uh, uh, everything else I said, you, can, you could do it over a graph. You don't need the fact that the ground field was the complex numbers. To, uh, you could do it over a variety of other fields. Thank you, just a secret remark. Your yes. t-shirt is of green size, green color. That's right. I'm, 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 I'm definitely there, yeah. Uh, I mean, yes. My, my t-shirt is green. So, um, um, so, um, so here, actually, the, the, you know, numbers really matter, right? So they will be, you know, in your family, there will certain parameter values z where special things happen. Maybe a cycle becomes algebraic. And, and those things are relevant. OK. So. Okay, so um, so to uh, you know, mirror. It's be, it's a well-known thing that sort of these two points of view are exchanged under mirror symmetry. So um, I will do an example which is very close to the most classical one, rather than trying to formulate things sort of abstractly. Okay, so um, uh, so the the example is this thing here um, that um, you know on the on the. Uh, symplectic topology side, I look um, at a pencil of cubics on CP2. So the line bundle is O of 3, which is the anti-canonical bundle, which is always the case in mirror symmetry. Um, it is not quite a generic pencil. So um, you could, I could have done it for a generic pencil, but this is a slightly simpler situation. So one section I choose x0, x1, x2 on P2. So the zero set of that is, is a chain of, uh, of three, whoa, um, of three plus one. I wish I could edit this thing here, but it's too late, so this will stand as a mark of my shame. Um, and um, and uh, S infinity, S0 is a gen S zero now will choose generically, um, and um, it will, um, yeah, it, it will, um, so it, then it doesn't matter very much which one you choose, okay? So the, the base locus of these things are nine points, and um, the, the generic fiber is an elliptic curve, so it's, since I'm thinking topologically, let me say it's a torus, um, and there are nine critical points. In fact, if, if you remove the fiber at infinity, you just get the open torus, uh, C star cross C star. Okay? So the, um, it's a little bit confusing, uh, uh, just a, a special feature of this example that the mirror looks vaguely similar, but you shouldn't attribute any importance to these similarities. So, um, so the mirror is, uh, you know, roughly speaking, it's 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 an orbifold. So you take a, take CP two uh, divide by Z three, um, in a way that gives you uh, Crepin you know, singularities, A two singularities, which admit Crepin resolutions, right? Resolve them, or you can just think of working on the orbifold, um, and it, you you look at essentially uh, the same thing, except uh, the fiber at infinity will now look differently. Uh, because you, you, you did this resolution, so it's, it's a chain of nine uh, rational curves. And uh, because of this Z3 quotient, um, you now have three base points um, and, and you have um, three critical points. And in fact, you know, if you write down the, the function W in explicit coordinates, it is um, this one here, the, the, you know, which is well-known play a role mirror symmetry for, for P2. Okay? So this is this geometry here. So, so this... Um, Maybe naively speaking, I would say it appears that this um, x check is slightly bigger than x, right? On account of you know, its total Betty number or something. Uh, but in the way that the complexity is accounted for, um, they actually become equal. So this is the way that the um, complexity is accounted for. And um, I have to warn you that you know, now there will be sort of, you know, when, when this subject started, there was like, you know, a, a symplectic and an algebra geometric side, and each side there was a single category. And as the subject developed, there's sort of various versions you can do, which give rise to all sorts of categories. So later, when we get to a, a couple of slides forwards, you will see that there are a lot of boxes. Now I just make a list of stuff, and later we'll try to put the stuff into boxes. Okay? So the, um, you know, on the algebraic geometry side, uh, maybe the simplest thing you could do is that uh, you could take your, your Variety x check, okay, it's smooth, and you consider its derived category, which by which I mean the bounded derived category of coherent sheaves. Okay, um, so this thing here, um, it's what it's 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 um, it's K theory has uh, rank nine. Okay, uh, and so the corresponding thing on the uh, symplectic side is um, 
uh, is that you take, you take this W, which is this uh, Lefschetz vibration over the affine line, and um, there is a Foucault category associated to it whose objects are um, essentially Lefschetz symbols. Since we have nine critical points, we have a, can, you know, have a basis of nine Lefschetz symbols which generate everything. And so, so this Foucault category um, will be the mirror of this, of this derived category here. Okay? Um, uh, you know, obviously, a, another thing um, which is maybe more obvious on the uh, symplectic geometry side is uh, instead of considering this vibration by itself, why don't we just uh, consider a single fiber? So the fibers of W are this uh, XZ minus the base locus. So it's a, it's a, in this case here, it's a punctured um, elliptic curve, T2 minus nine points. Um, and this, roughly speaking, this, this corresponds to uh, the fiber at infinity um, of the mirror pencil. Now, this X check infinity um, is, uh, is uh, singular. So if I write D of X check infinity, it's not particularly well behaved. So I replace it by something which is slightly better behaved, which is you know, the, the subcategory of perfect complexes. Okay? But maybe I shouldn't have made a distinction, and I should just call everything D and just said if it's singular, then D is perfect complexes, because that's what I like and it's well behaved. It's a question about you know, which finiteness properties you're going to impose. What do you think of something being bounded and, and uh, compact, in a sense? OK, so, so these do correspond. And then the next version is something which is um, you know, where the subject actually, uh, so, so now we're, we're sort of going away, and we're converging, going backwards in time towards the version that the subject actually started. So this is this xz minus b. This is a puncture torus. So I can put the punctures back. So the way that, that you do it, put the punctures back, is in the original thing, uh, you know, you considered curves on this puncture torus, and you considered, you know, polygons, so holomorphic maps on the puncture torus. Now let's consider holomorphic maps on the torus, and see how often do they actually go over the punctures. Okay, if they don't go over the punctures at all, now we're working in the complement of the punctures. If they go over the punctures one, you count them with a formal parameter q. If they go twice, you count them with q, q squared. So that gives rise to um, what's called the relative Foucault category. Um, of the torus relative to these punctures. Um, it's a category which has a formal parameter q. And if you set q equals 0, you can recover the thing that you had before. Right? And so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a formal one parameter deformation of the previous thing. And so unsurprisingly, you know, if you have the, um, you know, you have the, here you had the, the, the mirror pencil. You have the fiber at infinity. The fiber at infinity is the fiber at infinity in this family of fibers. So you can, um, you know, Instead of taking just a point at infinity, you can take a formal disk near infinity, um, parameterized by some parameter q. And um, so that gives rise to you know, a, a scheme over this uh, spec uh, C double bracket q, uh, um, which is um, you know, this family of, of elliptic curves, which at q equals 0, it's singular, and otherwise it's non singular. So these correspond to here, but I haven't told you. Here, there's a natural choice of parameter q. I haven't told you how I'm choosing the parameter q on the other side. Um, that is much trickier. Okay? And so then the, the, the next step is, is relatively straightforward, which is uh, to we have this formal parameter q. Let's invert q. So we introduce q inverse. On the algebra geometric side, that means that uh, I pass to the generic fiber, which is now a smooth elliptic curve. So it's uh, over this uh, ground field. Um, uh, so this is, this is where this is um, Konsevich's original version of, um, of homological mirror symmetry, which says that in this case here, it just means that you know, we work over the, over the compact torus and we forget the things. You know, um, you know, we allow inverse, it, allowing inverses of the parameter q basically allows your objects which are curved to sort of pass over the punctures. So it's effectively as if you actually worked on, on the actual torus. Okay? Now, um, so th this is the classical version. Now, another thing which, uh, which you can do, um, certainly, would be on, on this side here, plop. Um, you could just remove the fiber at infinity. OK? Um, and then, then so, so you get an open variety. And you consider its derived categories. This is smooth, so I don't have to worry about what I'm doing. And uh, you know, at some point, it was realized that there is a corresponding thing uh, on the symplectic geometry side, which looks quite similar. Um, which is uh, where I, I take my CP2, I, I remove this uh, fiber here, and um, I, 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 now I, I do something which is called this uh, script W. So it's, a, it's another version of the Foucault category, which I also script F. It's called the wrapped Foucault category. So it has non-compact 
Lagrangian submanifolds, just like the previous left shed symbols, which were also non-compact, but the left shed symbols are only allowed to go to infinity in a particular specified way that's dictated by the left shed vibration. Here they can go to infinity in a, in a rather freer way. Um, and the price that you pay between them to make sense of this is that the morphism spaces are infinite uh, dimensional, which is pretty good because the morphism spaces here are also infinite dimensional. Okay, and the last thing I'm missing from my collection is, you know, um, how about mirror symmetry for CP2 itself? Of course, that, that's, a, um, that's something that you might want to do instead of, you know, passing to fibers or removing parts of it. Um, So, the, the, so there is a, a Fukaya category of CP2. There's also actually a, a one parameter um, family of these things here <laughs> that depends on a, on a complex number um, Z, some kind of a bulk parameter. And so what, what happens here is that um, you see there should be a W check here, a, a typo. So you remove the, so here you have this dual pencil, you remove the fiber at infinity, then you have this function, W check to A1, and there's a way to associate to it um, um, a, a category, um, the, the Landau, category of Landau-Ginsberg brains. Um, so locally speaking, this, what, what's happening here is that we have the, the total space, which is smooth algebraic variety. Uh, we consider a Z2 graded, um, Z2 periodic complexes of, uh, uh, you know, vector bundles on it. And um, we, with a differential where the differential um, does not square to zero, but it squares to W, or if you, you can put in a, a parameter, which is a constant Z, they square to W minus Z. Oh, do, do you really mean bulk? Do you mean like central charge? I never... Oh, I'm saying Kenji's use of bulk is not this. Well, this is bulk, yes. It's a constant bulk. It's a multiple of the identity that I'm using as... No? Maybe it's not. Okay, I know, but probably wrong word. Okay. It's a constant identity. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, just um, so so you get this thing here, uh, which is called the um, uh, Landau-Ginsberg um, category here. Um, so and this is uh, this is uh, mirror to this thing here. Now, w when I say mirror, you know, uh, in most cases there are certain form closures and the formal operations which you're supposed to do to make things match up. But I'm I'm just uh, omitting all of them. Um, and there is one more thing which uh, we have no idea how to make an actual geometric counterpart, which is, you know, here, this is an actual, you, you get an actual family of elliptic curves. You know, we have a, a good mirror to the fiber at infinity, um, which was right here. We have a mirror to the fiber near infinity, which is right there. So it's a natural question to ask, oops, what is the mirrors, to, are there mirrors to the other fibers, which are actual nice, smooth elliptic curves of a C? And we have no idea. And yes. I have a doubt uh, in your previous slide. Yes. Yeah. When you consider a relative Foucault, you call count intersection <coughs> with this uh, B. Yeah. You should get kind of uh, curve, uh, formal family of Calabria or so, uh, whatever, yeah? yeah? Yeah. But in flat coordinates, and it should be not algebraic curve, not your original family of uh, it's. I mean, I, I sorry, I, I didn't say that this parameter Q is equal to, I mean, well. Yeah, no, no, but it, <laughs> even, even after realization, it's, it's made so, it makes no, I don't really believe it, because if you consider, if you count here intersection with B, yes. you, you get a curve which is a straight curve in the flat coordinates, yeah, and, and so let's suppose you have not, no fiber something mm -hmm. to curve it on yeah, the five dimensional yeah, yeah. area. And this straight curve is not a germ of algebraic curve in the model of Calabria, because here consider on the mirror side you consider algebraic curve in the model of Calabria, yeah? Yes. It's, 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 they don't really fit, yeah. I, I don't quite, I mean, there, there's only one parameter anyway, so. Oh, no, no, you, 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 yeah, you have some, uh, you have, you get one parameter family here to elliptic curve minus, minus something. Yes. But in more complicated examples, there will be some algebraic curve in high dimension model of space. Yes. And it's not a straight line and flat coordinates near the cusp. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm not claiming that this is a description of what happens in general. Ah, ah, okay? This is just this case, because if I do general things, I have to put in caveats and assumptions and everything all over the place. Yeah, 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 okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it will be a description in some cases, and if you don't think that's true, then you should tell me. Okay? So uh, uh, think you, I, I'll, I'll remind you of your objection later, and then, then you can kill me. So, okay, so, um, right. Um, so, okay, so uh, who, who invented all these things and who came up all these things? And, uh, you know, uh, the answer is obviously not, it wasn't all me. So, the same thing with, you know, with names. Okay, so, um, 
So let's see. So the, 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 you know, the Fukaya categories that I'm using just in their plain flavor, say for a puncture torus, obviously due to Fukaya. Um, the version for Lefschetz vibrations um, is, is, is with these uh, Lefschetz symbols is, is as far as I know um, due to Konsevich. And I, I sort of wrote it down, a big deal. Uh, the full relative version I also wrote down, but it's also no big deal. Uh, on the algebraic geometry side, well, uh, this is Verdier's thesis. Um, I don't know who invented perfect complexes, but you know, anyway, I, I don't think anybody's uh, going to ask me to assign precise credit for this thing here. Um, so the the um, you know the the version of mirror symmetry in this case here, um, well, actually, uh, you know. There's a computation in, in Kuntzevich's original paper which essentially proves it. Um, and then uh, there was a, a lot more computations uh, which, which sort of, I don't know, uh, done by Polishuk and Zaslo. Um, and um, the, the limiting version where you have sort of a punctured torus, I mean, no, nobody really knows who, who should take credit for it. Uh, the one here is, is in a paper by um, Oru Katsarkov and Orlov. Um, no, but if, we, if now X is really elliptic curves, it's a concrete example, not general variety. The G of X, G tag is, is it does, uh, it's not really <laughs> to define the derived category of elliptic curve. <laughs> it's not very dear to define the derived category of, of, well, in this case here, it's of CP2, of the CP2 orbifold. I mean, I don't know, I know. Okay, well. Um, so, um, so over here, uh, well, um, you know, this is now, this is the Fukaya category of the, the actual elliptic curve with this parameter here, I don't know, I just wrote Kaya Oja and Ono, obviously their, their theory is much more general than this. So in this case here, it was already in, in Konsevich and in Polish Zaslo, who also proved this thing here again. Um, well, these wrapped to Kaya categories were, were introduced by, by um, a bunch of people, among them uh, Abu Zaid and myself. And actually this particular special case here, could, you could do by hand, but but you know these kind of arguments that actually compute the wrap category probably also um, should be credited to the two of us. Uh, this thing here, um, uh, this 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 FZ uh, uh, done by by, by Young and O oh and and Fukaya and 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 uh, Cholly and Cho and uh, a number of other people, um, you know, to prove this thing here. I mean, it's essentially, the, um, the this in this particular case here. Um, these categories are rather simple, so you can sort of prove that, sort of match objects one to one. The missing thing is to show that you know you have accounted for all the objects for CP two, and um, you know that, that's where this long list of names here comes from. Oh, and so matrix factorizations were invented by Eisenberg, and the, the categories, um, the triangulated categories, sort of there's a long paper by Buchweiz, which is somehow relevant, and then there is uh, you know uh, Olof who sort of gave a different definition and so on, developed the theory um, to a very large extent, especially beyond the case of affine varieties, which was the, the focus of the original theory. Okay, I, I hope I didn't, does anybody want to correct me on the names? I'm, I, I tried my best, okay, but. Uh, I, okay, so, so we, on both sides we have like all sorts of different categorical structures. How are they all related to each other? Okay. Okay. Fun. Let's look at the algebraic geometry side. Okay. So we have the total space of the pencil, and we have um, one of the hypersurfaces. Let's say the one at infinity. That's what appeared. Obviously, there's restriction and inclusion factors. Okay. Well. Um, so then we have the 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 fiber uh, at infinity and the fiber in a formal disk near infinity, and obviously there's some kind of deformation theory there. And then when you want to pass to the punctured formal disk, you just invert the parameter. That's just a, like a, you know, a simple process. You just invert Q. There's nothing going on here. Um, when you, what happens when you try to remove um, X infinity, right, and pass to the complement? You can actually do it uh, by a sort of, uh, um, yeah, well, this is a localization. You pass to an open subset. Uh, there's a corresponding sort of categorical notion of localization where you take the, the image of perf inside here and you quotient it out. Um, and then you get the, the derived category of the complement. And then the passage from this thing here um, to the um, Lander-Ginsberg category, you can think of it um, 
in a way as a, for, as a deformation and then passing to the generic fiber, you have to be somewhat careful because the, the, the deformation parameter has degree two. So the, the theory doesn't quite look like ordinary deformation theory. But I'm just going to allow myself to just sort of say this. Okay? And exactly the same thing holds on this side here. You, know, you have left shift symbols, they have boundaries, which are vanishing cycles in a fiber. So there's a similar restriction functor. There's an adjoint functor, a little bit more complicated to describe. Um, once you are in a fiber, there's a formal deformation that gives you to the relative category and so on. And uh, maybe most substantially for the point of view of symplectic geometry, um, you can obtain the wrapped category as a sort of categorical localization of this um, this category of the vibration. So it would seem that you know, we're all set. Right? There's a web of relationships. There's a corresponding web of relationships. Now, this is really not good. Okay? Um, why is it not good? Well, for two reasons. One is you know, I can make funny arrows here. But the funny arrows don't mean that things actually determine each other. So this arrow here with the dots, this is like a, you know, a, a, a little you know, reproduction of the picture here on the right. Um, this funny thing here with the dot and this thing here is a dot are deformations. Well, you know, just because I say it's a deformation, it doesn't mean that you know what the deformation actually is going to be. There has been some success in you know, doing, using abstract deformation theory as a shortcut for computations. But uh, still, you know, that just doesn't determine this one here. Okay? And also the question is, you know, where's the center of the picture actually? Right? So, I mean, uh, you know, if you look back, it seems like with the arrow going, it seems that this pair here is the center of the picture. Okay? But, um, you know, really, if you look at it from a point of view of geometry, the center of the picture is, um, is given by the pencil, right, itself. And there's nothing here which is responsible to the pencil, because the, the objects that are here in the middle actually depend only on what the topology is after you throw away the fibers at infinity. So now I'm, I'm talking about the, the green part, right? So they, you know, if I focus on this square here, I actually forgot that um, this thing here extends over CP1. And clearly, I cannot, I cannot hope to recover all the data if I forgot this crucial geometric fact. OK, so um, um, actually, uh, let me skip this thing here in the interest of clarity. Um, I have one. I'll, I'll show it to all the specialists later, secretly. OK, so then you have to, um, you have to also forget this box here. OK, so, but let me say it as much as this thing here. So th there are cases where um, on the symplectic geometry side, it looks essentially the same. You have a pencil. But on the algebraic geometry side, you get something which isn't quite classical algebraic geometry. It could be some kind of non-commutative deformations. Or it could be something where instead of the variety, which was supposed to be you know, the x check, is itself not a variety by the lambda Ginzburg model. And then you have some kind of vibrations of that. And so formally speaking, things sort of look the same. Um, but um, on the algebraic geometry side, it's not really a pencil in the sense of, of classical algebraic geometry. And this is um, it's actually a good thing about this game here, which is because the, the supply, it gives you a window into you know, what non-commutative algebraic geometry and various exotic versions should actually look like, um, it corresponding to still symplectic geometry. So, so what we're going to think about is you know, what, what is actually a pencil. Okay? So let's think, let me uh, be slightly less ambitious and think what is actually a, a divisor, an effective divisor, a hypersurface. So what is it? So I have a variety. Now the, the notation is going to switch temporarily um, because you know, I, I'm going to write x, but I'm going to do algebraic geometry in it because I'm going to forget about mirror symmetry for, for a while. So you have a variety. You have your line bundle. You have a non-zero section that gives rise to a divisor. Um, but um, instead of looking at the actual hypersurface that it defines, um, I prefer to look at a sort of DG resolution of this. So I take the structure sheaf um, and I take the direct sum with the invertible sheaf L placed in degree minus 1. Um, so this is, I think of this as the, the exterior algebra on L. Um, so this is a, a Z graded sheaf over X. I equip it with a differential that's given by S. So this is a, a, a a, a sheaf of, of, of DG algebras, which I think of as some kind of differential graded scheme. And this is actually quasi isomorphic to, to the hypersurface, which means this thing here is acyclic everywhere except outside the hypersurface. And on the hypersurface, it's, it just, its cohomology is O. OK? 
Okay? And it's actually you know, somehow quasi-isomorphic in some DG, DG algebra sense. Okay? So the, the motto is that when I think of this hypersurface here, I don't want to think of the hypersurface. I want to think of this hypersurface here as an extension of x by this line model. Okay? And the same thing is uh, if I have a pencil, I want to think about it as a family of extensions of, of x by line model that's parameterized by the projective line, so it's parameterized by two homogeneous coordinates. Happiness? Excellent. Well, assuming hypersurface being smooth. No? no, I didn't say that. Did I say that? I didn't say that. OK. OK. I mean, the fi for instance, the fiber, at, you know, not all fibers of the pencil can be smooth, right? Sorry. Yes. You said family. Excuse me? So you said family, family parameterized by? P1. By P1. So it's parameterized by two, it has two homogeneous variables. The notion of DG scheme over P1, is that what you're thinking? Yeah, 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 pretty much, yeah. yeah. I mean, over A2, over A2 with some homogeneity property. Oh. Ah, that's pretty simple. OK, so let's see what, it, what this, so now I'm going to take this stuff here and I'm going to translate it all into abstract non-commutative geometry. OK, so, so instead of my original variety x, I'm going to have um, a, a non-commutative space here, which is, um, uh, you know, and for me, it, I'm kind of, I got addicted to this language of A-infinity structures. Um, if you, so I would like to, this to be an A-infinity algebra. Um, if, what if you don't like or don't want to like um, A infinity structures? Well, you can assume that it's a DG algebra, okay? But you'll have to pay for it in the next step. There's no loss of generality, but the, you'll have to pay for it in the next step. So the next step is to say, okay, this guy here, now I need something which uh, replaces the, um, the, the line bundle itself. So I'm going to uh, re replace it by bimodule. Uh, which is invertible with respect to tensor product. Um, so which means there's another bimodule, which, which you tensor them together, you get the diagonal bimodule. Or let's say tensoring with P is an invertible operation. Um, and so you know, what you will have to pay is that you know, in the A infinity world, any A infinity bimodule is you know, homotopically flat and homotopically projective and homotopically anything. Um, whereas if you work in the DG world, you have to put in a bunch of assumptions on P. So you have to find a pseudo, choose a pseudo resolution. But there is no actual substantial difference. Okay? So what do I want to do is now I want to make an extension. So I take A, I add P, shift it down in degrees by 1, and I want to make this into an A infinity algebra. Okay? And this I will call non-commutative divisor. There's some conditions that I want to have. So if you know an A infinity algebra, it's given by multilinear operations on B. Okay? So my first condition is obviously I have to somehow, it has to, has to have something to do with the original A. So the condition is, if you take your multilinear operations and all your inputs are in A, then your output is in A and it recovers the original structure of A. Okay, so A sits inside there. The next simplest case would be to say I take all the inputs in A except one, okay? Um, and oops, I didn't say it. And the one lies in P, and here I didn't write it right. So when you have the, uh, when you have the um, one input in P, you could land in A or you could land in P. If you just consider the component that lands in P, it recovers the bimodule structure of P. Okay? So, so you could do the same thing here in a more classical context here. So then, you know, it's a, it's a kind of extension of this DGA by this DG bimodule. But it's not a square zero extension, okay? So you can have operations which takes uh, several P's and output something non-trivial. Okay. So this thing here, I call it, I decided now to call it a non-commutative divisor, but it's not entirely new. There's a version of this where P is the, um, the dual diagonal bimodal, which, uh, for instance, appears in uh, Kuntsevich, Blasophilus. Excuse me? Would the second summon be an ideal in B or not? Would the second summon be an ideal? No, absolutely not. In fact, that, that's, here I wrote it in a confusing way, but you'll see it in a second. Uh, yeah, there you go. So, so let me consider, so, so there is in fact, the, there is a part where you take all inputs in A except one in P and you land in A. Okay, so let's, let's look at this part here. And the way to say that part here is, let's consider B itself, not as an algebra, just as a, as a bimodule over the subalgebra A. Okay, so here's B. So this means that we consider only those operations where all inputs except possibly one lie in A. Okay, so then there's, 
you know, the assumptions say that, you know, there's A sits inside of it as a bimodule over itself. The quotient bimodule is P, but the extension is not necessarily split. Okay? And in fact, the boundary map of this extension is, uh, because of the way that I shifted the grading, is a bimodule homomorphism from P to A. Since A is invertible, it's also a morphism from A to P inverse, which you want to think of as a section of P inverse. Okay? And this thing here I call the first order part of the non-commutative divisor. And so the corresponding thing is, I actually want to use geometric language. So when I say A, I just call it the ambient space where the divisor lives. P, I call the line bundle. So this sigma here, I call the section of the inverse. That's what defines the divisor. And B, I just call the divisor by itself. That's what it is. It's this extension. Um, so so if, we, you know, if we forget about A, just consider B as an infinity algebra. That's the divisor by itself. So um, there's a slight surprise here that you know, sigma, in general, is not really everything, right? So there are higher order terms. And those higher order terms, you can be analyze them into obstruction theory. There are obstruction groups. The pieces of those obstruction groups are homes between tensor, higher tensor powers of P and A. They lie in certain degrees, OK? So um, you can ask them, you know, why didn't I see those pieces in classical algebraic geometry? You know, in classical algebraic geometry, you give the line bundle, you give the section, and you're, you're done, right? There's no extra data needed. It's because in the classical algebraic, these all live in negative degrees, the higher order obstruction. In the classical algebraic world, there are no negative degree homes, and you will not see these things. These are homes of bimodules. These are homes of bimodules, yes. OK? Well, these yes. Are effective divisors, right? This is always effective divisor. When I say divisor. You think about you know, meromorphic sections of these guys? Uh, not yet. OK, These, when I say divisor, I always mean effective divisor. Yeah. So one thing that, that has occurred before um, in the story on the algebra geometric side is where I removed the divisor and considered its complement. Right? And I said that on the level of categories, this can be interpreted as a categorical localization or quotient construction. And the same thing is true here. You basically you take A by module, uh, sorry, you take A modules, and B is an A module, and you kill B. OK? And so this gives you a, a localization construction in the sense of you know, Keller and Drinfeld. And I just write it geometrically as saying, you take A and we remove B. Okay? But you could write, you know, that's obviously a highly non-traditional way of writing it. Um, OK, so, um, so now we know what a non-commutative uh, divisor is. Uh, what is a non-commutative pencil? Okay. Well, it shouldn't be very hard, right? It's a, it's a family of non-commutative divisors that's parametrized by uh, two homogeneous variables. So we just have to get the homogeneity right. So, okay. So um, let me fix a, um, you know, there are two parameter space. If you want, you can set it equal to C squared, but, you know, as usual, maybe you don't want to. There could be a space and a dual space. And so um, I, I want to have the same thing. I start with, with A, which is my space, my line bundle, which is this bimodule P. And I, I do the direct sum, as usual, which gives this B. Now I want to have operations here. But the operations are parameterized uh, by, this, uh, by these two variables. So they land an additional tensor product, which is the symmetric algebra. And, um, so you have to take, a, um, take care of the homogeneity, right? So. Um, you have two homogeneous parameters. If you set the two homogeneous parameters to zero, um, you recover, you're supposed to recover sort of the trivial non-commutative divisor, which is just given by taking A and P and putting them together with nothing. Okay? So, so the way to do it is to say, well, B is A direct sum P. You introduce some kind of you know, weight grading, where this thing here is weight one, and that has weight zero. And then V has to have weight one. And then you ask for this thing here to preserve weights. And you also ask, I mean, that, you know, before that, there were some conditions about that you know, certain restrictions recover A or recover P. And let me just say that you know, if you take any W and you pair with W, you just get, so you make this thing here into scalars by evaluating a W, then you recover a non-commutative divisor. But you could also formulate it in a general way. OK, so this is a generalization of an A infinity structure. You can think of it as um, an A infinity structure over this um, symmetric algebra, but that doesn't quite capture all the structure because of the homogeneity that's involved, which is sort of non-traditional. Non okay, so it doesn't quite reduce to something that you've seen before, but you know, it does, um, it does uh, produce a um, um, you know, a, a family you can specialize to any W, and then it produces a non-commutative divisor. 
which we saw before. Okay, and um, it, put, it actually, if you rescale W, then you get um, you know quasi-isomorphic specialization. So it's really actually parameterized by the projective line, the non-trivial part of it. Okay, and so so obviously this is non-commutative geometry. One test is that the ordinary commutative geometry fits into it. So if you have a smooth algebraic variety and you have um, a pencil of, of hypersurfaces, as defined before, it actually gives rise to a non-commutative divisor, a non-commutative pencil. Oh my God! Um, so um, where, where A is uh, corresponds to the derived category somehow, and P corresponds to L, and everything's like that. And did I have to work hard on this? No, you don't have to work hard because, as I said, there's some obstruction theory. All the higher obstructions vanish, so it's kind of straightforward. Um, this is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. For instance, um, you know, when I first defined uh, divisors, I could have wanted sections to be non-zero and so on. But in principle, you can let the sections be zero or other degeneracy, and you will still land in something that's in non-commutative geometry. I don't know what, that's not a, I don't think of that as being a problem. OK. So just as before, I said, you know, the, the, um, the non-commutative divisor, you can think of it as this bimodule map, which is the first order part, and there's obstruction theory. So the same thing is true for the pencils here. So you have, um, you know, you, you look at a part of it, so, so you get a, a, a two-parameter family of bimodule maps, or if you just choose two basis vectors, you just get two different bimodule maps, which are called the first order part. So these are, think of sections of P inverse. So those are your two sections that define them. And then there is a sort of deformation theory treatment. Actually, the, the way to understand this deformation theory is, uh, in a reasonable way, uh, is, you know, is to, to put it into the framework of the maura Catan formalism. Okay? So when you actually, there's a bi-graded DG Lie algebra um, such that if you have a non-commutative divisor structure with fixed A and P, that corresponds to a solution of maura Catan in this DG Lie algebra. Or what is the same thing is that a solution of maura Catan is the same thing as an L-infinity map from a, a trivial one-dimensional Lie algebra into your target G. Okay? And so what we're doing here is just simply instead of having one, we have two. Okay. And the reason why you see from this point of view why you see symmetric powers here, that's just part of the formalism of L infinity maps. Yes. Sorry, because because Lie algebra depends on line bundle, yeah? No, no, no. You fix the yes, the Lie algebra depends on the line bundle, that's right. Bundle in pencil is high. No, no, it's a, a fixed line bundle. Yeah. Fixed line bundle. Yeah. Okay. So now I have defined a non commutative pencil. What can I do with it? Okay. Well, you know, originally I said if you have a divisor, you know, you have the space, you have the the infinity algebra corresponding to the divisor, and you have the complement. Okay. So now we can have more fun. Obviously, we have the fiber. We can take the fi you know, there's an infinity algebra which corresponds to the divisor associated to any point in CP1, but you can also do more general points. So, for instance, you know, instead of considering a single value of z, I can consider a formal disk around some value, and then I get an A infinity algebra which is associated to that, uh, which is over a one parameter. Uh, you know, it's parameterized by this formal disk and is a deformation of this bz. Okay. Obviously, what you can also do as before, you can take this quotient construction which formally removes the fiber. You could do it to any fiber, of course, but um, you know. The fiber at infinity will be more, more interesting to us. And most importantly, actually, in parallel, so you know, what I, the, the, when I first, the slide number one, I said a pencil, I said you remove the fiber at infinity and then you have this function w, okay, which is s0 divided by s infinity. And there is actually an analog of this thing here, which I call the non commutative Landau Ginzburg model, uh, which is a, a sort of a formal deformation of this guy here, but with a, with a deformation parameter of degree two. Um, I don't understand it very, very well so far. I, I've wrote down the definition for it, and it, it seems to make sense in examples. But so this is this is maybe the the most. This is the, something where you really need, you know, for both this b hat and this one here, you really need the pencil. Except here, you just need the pencil in a formal neighborhood of the point. This really uses the entire pencil. Okay. So is this some kind of two periodic geometric category object? Yes. 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 It's a two-periodic um, infinity algebra or something, which is, and you, usually when I say the algebra, I secretly mean some kind of category associated to it. But, okay. So, so now we finally get back to my original thing of symplectic geometry. How many, right? how many parameters are in this definition? One. And in all examples, it would be one? In all examples, it would be one. I mean, there is no obstruction to introducing uh, non-commutative higher dimensional linear systems, they follow the same thing. But um, I haven't found any 
fantastic use for them at the moment. OK, so let's go back to symplectic geometry, OK? And let's do some stuff, OK? So uh, let's look, let me look at a, at a, at a pen, left shift pen, as a pencil now from a symplectic geometry point of view. Uh, I'm going to now, because I want to state an actual theorem, I will make all sorts of simplifying assumptions. So I'm going to take a symplectic manifold. Um, and, and the symplectic class, is, it's like the symplectic counterpart of Fano. So the uh, symplectic class is equal to the uh, uh, anti-canonical class, and uh, now I want to take a pencil, and I don't care. Now I don't care anymore whether it comes from algebraic geometry or not, as long as uh, it qualifies as a pencil under symplectic geometry. A pencil associated to this uh, L to this anti-canonical line bundle, which is ample, um, and so it has fibers which are symplectic hypersurfaces. It has a base locus, and but I'm, now I'm, I'm going to assume that you know it's really a left shift pencil. In particular, the fiber at infinity is, is smooth, and the other fibers have generic singularities. So my assumptions that I've done here, um, this assumption here, and the fact that I'm using the anticanonical implies that the fibers have a zero first churn class, so they are symplectic calabi uh, It also implies that if I remove this fiber at infinity, the symplectic form becomes exact on the complement. And all of them help me to state stuff um, in, a, in a reasonably reasonable way. So, so as we saw, uh, so the basic category I'm going to use is the Foucault category of the left shift vibration, um, which is um, which is the one um, that uses left shift symbols, and the one that's supposed to be mirror to the total space if we had mirror symmetry. Okay, and the the, the theorem is that this comes with a canonical structure of a non-commutative pencil. So how does this pencil relate to the one that comes from the Olsen theory? No, I mean, look, okay, so the, the word pencil appears on this slide in two different ways, right? So you start with a pencil. This, is a, this could be a, a, what comes out from Donaldson theory here, right? The green thing, it's exactly, that would qualify, yeah? Um, and uh, uh, except, well, you know, Donaldson theory usually requires you to pass to a, to a power of this thing here, but here for simplicity, I mean, you know, it wouldn't break my heart to pass to a power, but I have to modify the formalism a, a little bit, okay? And then you get a pencil, but not in the ordinary sense, but in this kind of non-commutative geometry sense, a pencil living on this category here. So how is this, how is this pencil made up of, okay? So to make the pencil on this thing here, we need a bimodule. That bimodule is always the same. It's the dual diagonal bimodule, which corresponds to the anti It's some sort of non-commutative geometry version of the uh, excuse me, of the canonical line bundle. Um, so, so this has no additional information. It's just constructed from canonically associated to any A. And then um, well, I said that there were two, going to be two bimodule maps here. So, um, so there are two bimodule maps from A dual to A, if you want to think of it in categorical terms, as two natural transformations from the ser functor to the identity. And they actually play wildly different roles. So the one that I call sigma infinity, you know, it exists actually for any left shift vibration over C. Um, and it has to do with the, um, well, it's hard to say. It has to, the the, the, the Serre functor in, on the, in this category here has a geometric interpretation which involves rotating your direction in which the left shift symbols go. And because it's part of a one parameter family, that family gives rise to this sigma infinity. Now, the sigma zero is totally different. It actually only exists for pencils that actually can be extended over infinity. Maybe it can't be extended smoothly over infinity, may not be necessary, but definitely there, there's some, it encodes the fact that, you know, if you, res, if you have this guy here that maps to C, the monodromy around a large circle is essentially the identity, okay? And you will use this to construct this thing here in more, uh, maybe in more intrinsic ways. It, it sort of counts holomorphic sections of your pencil that go through the fiber at infinity, okay? Okay. Uh, yes. So you, you said uh, the left shift pencil, the symplectic left shift pencil gives rise to a non-commutative pencil. Yeah. What if you just take a symplectic anti-canonical device, a single one? Will you uh, get a non-commutative anti-commutative device? That's right, but that's that's not new. Yeah. I mean, well, I have to be a bit careful. Sorry. You know, in principle, yes, there's, as usual, the literature is sort of sketchy. Well, would you say that the pencil, so if you take the generators of the original pencils, take the two symplectic devices? No, 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 no. That's the whole point I'm trying to make here. You know, this, this is a, this is a, a you know, a, a pencil over P1, 
But the, P, the P1 is not homogeneous. The point infinity plays a, a, a special role in this, in this story here. Um, and so does the point zero, in fact, to a slightly lesser extent. Okay? But so this is really a parameterized P1, and the point at, at infinity is, you know, is important. Okay, so now I have a now I have this symplectic geometry situation, and I associate to it a non-commutative pencil. On the other hand, the non-commutative pencil has all sorts of things associated to it. So let's see what they could mean geometrically. Okay? So Non-commutative pencil, one thing you can do, you can take a fiber, say fiber at infinity, and that should correspond to the Foucault category of a fiber of W, so a fiber, the fiber minus the base locus. But that, on the other hand, um, we could take uh, the fiber of the formal disk near infinity, and that should correspond to uh, the um, relative Foucault category, where you put in the base locus. Um, after a suitable change of variable, I mean, there's a question of, you know, what the deformation variable is, and uh, which is rather tricky. Um, and so this at least is internally a consistent picture because this relative Foucault category is a formal deformation of this one here, and this one here is certainly a formal deform uh, deformation of that one here. And it seems to work out well in example. And then obviously, if you take the fiber at a punctured formal disk of the non-commutative pencil, then that would correspond to inverting the deformation parameter, so you would land here. Um, on the other hand, you can, um, you, know, you can remove the fiber at infinity just by this quotient construction that should correspond to the wrap category of x minus this divisor. And then there's the most sophisticated thing, uh, which is this, um, you have this non-commutative pencil. You can do this non-commutative Landau-Ginzburg model. Um, and that should actually correspond to the Foucault category of the, um, of the original thing, um, x that you started with. Um, or maybe I should say it should be closely related to, and you can also get there these versions of the Foucault category which have what I maybe erroneously called bulk, and they, they just same thing that that's the Landa Ginsberg model where you take you subtract a constant, which is not a big deal. <laughs> um, so uh, the reason why I, you know all my statements tend to be a bit sketchy, but here I am particularly careful. For the following reason that, you know, the objects of the Foucault category of X, as, as we define it these days, um, are, are closed Lagrangian submanifolds of X. So if, you made a state, if I made a statement that says this is this, this actually amounts to a way of constructing closed Lagrangian submanifolds inside X, which actually nobody knows how to do in general. There's no way to predict whether this will be zero or not. Okay? Uh, now, my point of view is that, you know, this, just our definition of F of X isn't right. Um, but you, know, you have to be careful what you say here. OK, so this is my wishful thinking thing. Um, and here you can make your objection. But um, so I, I like this a lot better than 10 slides back. Why? Because we have one object in the middle. And all these arrows that I've drawn, they are strictly the object in the middle determines these things by you know, strict construction. OK, you have this guy here, and you get everything. And, um, from a symplectic geometry point of view, you know, uh, this is interesting because the difficulty of computing the things in the outside boxes um, actually varies enormously. Okay? So, um, so um, you know, for, for this one here, strange enough, for these wrapped categories and, and for this one here, we have pretty good computational approaches. Uh, this one here is very hard. Um, uh, this one here is very hard in general. So, um, okay. So this was as far. Was that? In the constructions of all these arrows, yeah. was it really essential that the original symplectic pencil you took was left shift? Um, Take any, any pencil? I mean, you, you could. So for instance, if you have a toric funnel and one of the generators of the symplectic pencils is the toric divisor, and then you just take any other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what I said is, you know, the, the condition that the fiber at infinity is smooth um, is probably not essential. What happens is I used it in proving this theorem here. So I have to think again. But if you think of this, the reason why I formulated it in this way here is to open up the idea that, you know, if I just consider a case of fiber at infinity is smooth, I would have written here sigma zero depends on the fact that the monodromy at infinity is trivial. But I didn't quite want to say this, so this is for in case you want generalizations. Okay, so this is how, 
it, it looks like in my most optimistic moments, um, where is the things now and where I have the problem? So, so at least I proved that in some cases this non-commutative pencil structure exists. There's this, this relation here with the fiber, with the category of the punctured fiber. Um, I proved this one here to first order with respect to this weight thing, so ignoring the higher order parts of the pencil, which is um, you know, a reasonable indication, I think. Um, the, the relation to the wrap category is, is proved in a, a large part uh, by Mohammed and myself. Um, uh, but these, th these two things that remain are by far the most interesting things. Okay? So this thing here, the, the relation between the, the structure of the non-commutative pencil and the actual structure of the Fukai category of XZ, or if you want the relative Fukai category, um, this is completely conjectural. Um, uh, I have some ideas how to do it. That doesn't mean that I, I know how to do it. And there are a couple of warning signs. Okay? So one thing that is, I mean, um, so this thing here, this is a, a formal family of categories in this parameter Q. So you can look at um, you know, the Hochschild um, uh, and uh, say periodic cyclic homologies, and it carries a connection, which uh, you know, in many examples is equal to, you know, well, it, th there's a map. And if that map is an isomorphism, then that connection is equal to the sort of quantum connection or a model connection. Okay? And obviously, um, this, if this is true, then that, that corresponds that a model connection is uh, the non-commutative Gauss-Mannin connection that's associated to this family here. Uh, in a formal Disney infinity, which means that if you change variables back to the variables that are rational on the P1, then this connection extends rationally. Okay? And so I don't know that this is always the case from a symplectic geometry point of view. If it's not always the case, this is clearly wrong. On the other hand, if you know how to prove that this is always the case, I would love to hear this because that would help me, you know, help my confidence as far as proving this is concerned. Okay? So there's a prediction here which says that the A model connection after suitable change of variables extends rationally. Okay? And in fact, um, mod some uh, you know, open work non in, in non-commutative geometry, this should extend to a, to a regular connection uh, away from infinity. So, and uh, yeah, this one here is, is, is also conjectural, but at least here, because you have a formal deformation with a parameter of degree two, um, the amount of reparameterization that, that you can be wrong by is, is, is very small, essentially none. So, um, so um, you know, and in a sense, you know, there's a, a Denis of Roux's kind of, um, you know, interpretation of mirror construction in terms of discounting going through the fiber at infinity it should basically be a model for, for what I'm supposed to do here. Okay, and you know now. So I for, now I talked about symplectic geometry for a while. So the the um, you know the maybe overly naive picture of homological mirror symmetry is that you know you have two pencils on both sides, um, and one both pencils give rise to a non-commutative pencil structure. This one here, in a more straightforward way, you take the you know the derived category and you know you encode the commutative algebraic geometry into a non-commutative one and this one here in this way that um, that I've described where you pass through Fukaya categories um, and um, so so the hope is that these are actually the same you know there's an isomorphism of non-commutative pencil structure which then by this big thing here would imply all the other equivalences of derived of, of categories. So we sort of cleaned up this relationship um, and you know so on this side here obviously there are cases where you have a symplectic uh, especially if you drop this assumption here that it's a, it's a pencil, anti-canonical pencil, you get cases where the mirror is in all sorts of weird and wonderful versions of algebraic geometry. But the, the, you know, here you can generalize things easily because um, you know it's it's just algebra, so there's a hope that they fit all in. Um, but you know, I'm I'm not claiming this right. Okay, so this is uh, the end. Yeah, but for, you see that on, on a model set, it's you don't have continuous parameters in a sense, yeah. Or, That's right. Yeah, so it means it should be kind of algebraic pencils, kind of good given dependent of integers and. Uh, well, it is. I mean, the, this side here, yes, is defined over the integers, or yes, yes, yes. you know, at least over Q. Yeah, yeah no, because it's, it's, it's kind of in the same direction question. If you have, a, let's say, a plan variety, you can see the 
in simple in simple sense. Yeah. You can see the quantum product with this uh, canonical class. You get some integer matrix, or not maybe some more, some integer matrix. Also, you get gradient matrix. You get two integer matrix. Then you can build from them some connection on uh, like we have. Robin and it's mine. Yeah, 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 it should be have regulars and gradually to be also money connection. It should follow from all the speech, but it will be really object over integers which are structured. And these are objects can really canonical pencils to be on the right, yeah. Do you have Yeah, I mean that yes. Yeah. I, I that like like you know critical values should be I mean I, I uh, you know, I, I'll reformulate the, the objection in case somebody didn't, didn't hear it, or rather the, the, the comment was that, you know, this thing here is, has a canonical parameter, so there should be a, you know, and it's defined over Z, so here there should be, you know, a canonical pencil. And especially if you have multi, you know, if you look at the modular space of Calabi Yaus, you know, it's not clear that there is, you know, where the line should go through, right? But however, this predicts that there should be some way to, you know, single out a, a canonical line. Um. Yeah, also some remark we, we have uh, we made for two years uh, still preparation paper with Tony and with Mill, maybe you know, about Fano, how predict Hodge numbers, and there are plenty of conjectures about degeneration of Hodge to the run for uh, kind of, uh, exponential things, almost all of them proven by Sabah and Saito and so on, but something is still not proven yet, I can, I can share. We <laughs> also have tables, very similar tables, <laughs> plenty of categories, yeah. Yes. Other questions? If not, let's thank Paul again.